welcome everybody to today's webinar. Today's webinar is sexual harassment in the workplace in British Columbia. We've got two incredible guests. I'll be introducing them officially in a few minutes. They are Catalina Rodriguez and Kaylee Schiff. What you can expect today is legal information, um, not legal advice. We'll be answering some of the most common questions that come up in practice. If what you're looking for is legal advice as it relates to the facts of your own particular circumstances, then we would invite you to reach out to a lawyer. And the information that we're sharing with you is current as of today, January 25th, 2022. We'd like to acknowledge that the land on which the people's team is gathered is the unceded territory of the Musqueam First Nation, the Squamish Nation, and the Slel Watuth Nation. And we would invite all of you to consider the lands from which you are joining us today. Finally, we'd also like to thank our funders, the Department of Justice Canada, the Law Foundation of British Columbia, and the Notary Foundation of British Columbia, whose financial support has made the production of today's webinar possible. And finally, delighted to introduce our speakers. We have Catalina Rodriguez. Catalina is a lawyer with Forte Workplace Law. She has acted for clients who have brought claims of sexual harassment, and she has also acted for the employers defending those claims. So Catalina brings a wonderful perspective of having seen both sides of the equation. Catalina regularly trains employers on compliance issues, including workplace sexual harassment. And she also has investigated sexual harassment concerns and conducts independent third party investigations at workplaces. So welcome Catalina, it's so great to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you. And we have Kaylee Schiff. Kaylee Schiff is also a lawyer. She works um, at SHARP Workplaces with the Community Legal Assistance Society. SHARP stands for Sexual Harassment Advice and Response Prevention. And Kaylee advises her clients on topics related to workplace sexual harassment. She also delivers education and training workshops about the topic. So we are so delighted to have Kaylee with us here today. Welcome, Kaylee. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. You're very lucky. Um, we have two, our speakers are, are just excellent and so um, knowledgeable about this topic. So we're going to jump into the questions. The first question is for you, Catalina, and this is really a foundational question, is what is workplace sexual harassment and how do you know if you're experiencing it? So workplace sexual harassment is typically behavior by someone of a sexual nature that is unwanted and that the person knew or should have known that, that it would be unwanted. And the unwanted part is, is typically where the litigation um, of, of cases of this nature uh, focuses. Um, and it's a very important part of the definition. The, how do you know if you're experiencing it? Well, um, I've given you the elements, but it's typically what I've seen come across my desk are things such as uh, for sure unwanted touching. So uh, massaging on shoulders, um, good morning hugs that are not wanted, um, compliments that are of a sexual nature or, or uh, comments that are innuendo. Um, there's been co-workers who have shown videos to one another and the videos are of a sexual nature. I have unfortunately seen that pornography has invaded the workplace and the conversations amongst people in the workplace and not everybody is comfortable with those type of conversations. And what is also important to know, Paul, is that Workplace harassment, harassment can be between a, a, a boss or a manager and somebody in the team, but it can also be worker to worker, okay? At the core of sexual harassment, um, the, the cases have identified there is a power imbalance, but that power imbalance is not always because of position. It can also be because of the relationship between the two people. Um, I also want to clarify that when we're talking about workplace sexual harassment, we're not, we might or might not be talking about sexual assault, okay? So sexual assault is a crime under the Criminal Code of Canada. And the definition is, um, 
placing force, unwanted force onto another person. And I know it's a bit of a, di- of a, of a strange definition, but that's what it is. And the dealing of sexual assault under the criminal code has, has one way and one scheme and workplace harassment has another one. And we'll touch upon that a bit as, as we develop um, the session. Thank you so much, Catalina. That's really helpful. Um, just wanted to ask you a quick question, just given that so many of us are working remotely in this um, era, does it need to be in a physical workplace for sexual harassment to constitute sexual harassment in the workplace? I have seen it happen remotely, Paula. It happens via text messages. It happens via uh, comments made on Zoom. So yeah, you don't have to be present in the same, in the same place. Thank you, for, thank you for that, Catalina. Thank you for clarifying. This next question is for you, Kaylee. And there's a term that we hear, uh, microaggressions. Um, what are they and could they be workplace sexual harassment? Yeah, thanks, Paula. Um, I just want to add real quick to the definition of workplace sexual harassment before I jump into microaggressions as well, because um, as Catalina mentioned, it can be from your boss or it can be worker to worker, um, but it can also be from a client or a customer and your employer has an obligation to protect you from workplace sexual harassment, whether or not it's coming from a coworker or, or someone else that you come into contact with in relation to your work um, and whether or not you're you know, an employee or technically employed, um, it can also affect you. So if you're a volunteer, if you are working on contract, um, if you are working under the table or you're an intern, it can still be workplace sexual harassment as well. So I'm just just adding, <laughs> there's a, a lot of elements to add to that, a lot of sort of nuance to the definition. But um, yeah, in terms of microaggressions, I think um, microaggressions are really important because they can be an example of workplace sexual harassment. So the definition uh, would be they're so they're commonplace everyday slights or snubs or comments that communicate a negative message or a stereotype about a particular marginalized group. So it's a bit of an abstract <laughs> definition. So I'll give some examples. For instance, um, asking someone where are you from, just because they aren't white, but even though they're they're born in Canada and saying, you know, where are you really from? Those sorts of things, um, that would be a microaggression because having to repeatedly state that you are from this country, that you belong here just as much as everyone else, that's exhausting and really harmful. Um, I know another example could be telling women to smile more or calling women sweetheart and honey in the workplace. Um, And then also, you know, microaggressions. Some of these things can seem minor or small, uh, but actually they, can build up to cause a lot of harm. I mean, even one incident of a microaggression can be really harmful, um, but but yeah, they can really build on each other. And some of them can be hard to spot because they can seem almost like a compliment or they can almost seem well-intentioned. Um, and an example of that could be, uh, uh, you know, saying, like asking women, when are you getting married? When are you having babies? That's something that targets women because they're women usually. And uh, it relies on gender stereotypes and traditional gender roles. So, you know, it might seem like a, a, you know, a well-meaning question, um, but in the workplace, it can really be harmful. So yeah, another, another example of that could be saying to someone who's in a wheelchair, uh, you know, you're so brave, you're so strong. I could never go through what you're going through. That, uh, that would be an example of a microaggression because it um, sends the message that there's something wrong with being in a wheelchair and that they're inspiring only because they're in a wheelchair. So we can see that there's a lot of times when it's really easy to brush those off, sweep them under the rug, um, tell yourself that they didn't really mean it that way. But um, but the important thing about workplace sexual harassment is that it actually doesn't require the intent of the harasser, which means when the harasser um, you know, tries to defend themselves by saying, I didn't mean it, it was just a joke, I meant it as a compliment, that's actually not a defense to workplace sexual harassment. So it's really important to keep that in mind when, if you're experiencing microaggressions like that in the workplace. Um, and, and yeah, so, so in terms of whether they can be sexual harassment, one incident of a microaggression might not rise to the level of sexual harassment depending on the circumstances, but where we see them repeated in a workplace, 
that's when they create what we call a poisoned work environment. And that's where they are, workplace sexual harassment. Thank you so much, uh, Kaylee. I think you've done a really excellent job of, of explaining that term micro microaggression and how it might show up in a workplace setting. And I think it's um, you know, a, a call to all of us to really have an increased consciousness about what it is that we are saying to others and how that can be interpreted and how it can affect them. So thank you very much uh, for that. Um, this next question is also for you, Kaylee. Um, what happens if somebody at work is making unwanted comments about your gender expression and sexual orientation? Does that fall into the umbrella of workplace sexual harassment? Yes, it does. So Catalina mentioned it, that workplace sexual harassment is conduct of a sexual nature. So that includes conduct that targets someone because of their, their sex, their biological sex their gender identity, their gender expression, or their sexual orientation. Um, so what I mean by biological sex is that's the sex you're, you're born with. That's the sex that's assigned to you at birth. Um, that the doctors determine based on you know, the genitalia you're born with. And then gender identity is your own inner sense of your gender. So that may or may not align with your biological sex. Um, and it may, it's not just boy, girl, man, or woman. Um, there's a lot of different ways someone can identify, or a lot of different genders someone could identify with, um, in, including non-binary, which is an example. And then gender expression is, is how you display your gender outwardly to the world. Um, and ge sexual orientation is who you are or aren't attracted to. So, um, so in terms of how that could play out in sexual harassment, it could be, uh, you know, repeatedly using the wrong gender pronouns to refer to someone. Um, it's an example of a microaggression and it's an example of workplace sexual harassment. Another example could be saying to someone, you, you dress like such a tomboy to a non-binary person, for instance, commenting on how they express themselves, how they dress and whether it aligns with their gender or not. Um, so, so that's, you know, those are some common ways it could it could play out, but there's a lot of different ways that we could see that happening. Super. Thank you so much, Kaylee. That's that's really helpful. Catalina, this next question is for you. If you find yourself in a situation where you're being sexually harassed at work, what different options do you have? So you have various options. Let's start with the first um, sort of common sense one, which would be you can speak to the person who is harassing you and, and let them know how this is making you feel and ask them to stop doing what they're doing, okay? Now, <laughs> power imbalance, power dynamics may prevent you from having that conversation. And the seriousness of what's going on may also prevent you from having that conversation, right? If it's something easy like a microaggression, like what Kaylee was describing, for instance, the women at the front desk, they're described as girls. So one of the girls will take you in or, or talk to one of the girls. That's an easy conversation. To, can we stop infantilizing the women at the front? They're women. Easy conversation to have sort of thing. But if it's something more serious, um, you may not be able to have that conversation without fear of repercussion. I'm also very much aware that sometimes sexual harassment that has been ongoing and that is of a serious nature um, can re-traumatize someone who has trauma. And one of the side effects of trauma is that you shut down and your, your language centers shut down and you're actually physically incapable of saying anything, okay? So this is an option that may not work for you. Um, the second option you have is take a look at the, at the policy in your organization. Uh, in theory, every organization should have a policy that talks about harassment and bullying and there might be a process outlining that policy that you can follow, which typically starts with, yes, you speak to, to the harasser. Um, and then the second thing that you can do is speak to a manager or supervisor about what's going on or speak to human resources, okay? And that may, my, may launch an official investigation into what's happening, okay? Um, the third thing that, and, 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 and if an investigation is, is started, um, you have to be prepared to um, share what's happening with you and it will be advisable for you to start taking notes and, and start recording what's going on for you. Now, the next thing that you can do is to, um, I'll call it negotiate, okay? And by negotiation, I mean 
is try to reach a, an agreement or a settlement with the person that you're having problems with. And I wouldn't recommend that you do this alone. Okay, I've, I've represented people in this type of negotiations and they always work better when you have um, lawyer to lawyer or counsel to counsel. I've had the chance to have very um, senior and respectful counsel in this city assist with um, negotiation, negotiating a, 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 a deal or a settlement in which both parties can then move on. Um, a settlement of a sexual harassment complaint requires legal advice because you need to know what is it that you're agreeing to. And there's also a lot of work that I do with my clients about what does healing mean to you, okay? What does it look like for you? Does it look like you are moving ahead with, with some money and you're ready to move on to other things? Or what is it that you're seeking, right? Because for some people, what they want to prevent is this from happening to anyone else. And so they want to litigate this, okay? Uh, or sometimes as part of the negotiation, you, you, you agree that this person now resigns from the job, right? Um, and this is also, um, people who are respondents also require uh, legal advice. Um, number four, you can file a complaint with a human rights tribunal, okay? So um, the, the human rights code section 13 prohibits discrimination in the workplace. And if you have been at the receiving end of discrimination because of sexual harassment, you can file a complaint. You have to be aware that you have one year to do so. And that deadline is very important. You can also file a complaint with WorkSafe BC, okay? And through WorkSafe BC, you would uh, be able to obtain compensation um, for loss of earnings arising out of the incident. And that incident, um, there's a definition in the Workers' Compensation Act as to what is the type of incident that is compensable. And typically workplace harassment, once it is established that it occurred, it is, it is a compensable incident. And WorkSafe BC also have a suite of offerings for people inclusive of vocational rehabilitation, psychological assistance, and other things. Okay. Um, you can also discuss with uh, legal counsel the possibility of a constructive dismissal. In other words, if the work environment due to the sexual harassment became so toxic that you can no longer be employed or that the employment became something different to what it used to be, you may have a constructive dismissal claim, okay? Um, you also have the option of filing a civil suit uh, in court um, for the tort occurring out of the sexual harassment. And you can also file a criminal complaint if the matter amounts to sexual assault. All of those would, you know, would require their own webinar, but there are options that, that you should be discussing with legal counsel. If you are a member of a union, the first step is to reach out to your union representative. And then um, another option that you have is if this is happening um, in an environment that is regulated as a profession, you may reach out to the professional regulator. So that, those, that, that's an outline of the options you have. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Catalina. And because I have the benefit of my notes from our call earlier, I'll just recap. Those options are to speak to the person who is responsible for the harassment, to look uh, next to the company policy. Number three is to negotiate. Number four is to file a complaint with the Human Rights Tribunal. Number five is WorkSafe BC. Six is to go to court, whether it's a uh, constructive dismissal, civil suit, or criminal complaint. Um, we have the next option being uh, if it's a union to go to the union rep and then finally uh, if it's a professionally sorry a, a regulated profession to uh, look to the regulations so thank you so much Catalina those are um, excellent excellent to know all the different options that are available to you thank you um, this next question is for you Kaylee uh, something that you are an expert in is if you cannot afford a lawyer um, what free services are available to help yeah, so um, actually the organization I work at, uh, so I work at a free legal clinic, as you mentioned before, we're called Sharp Workplaces Legal Clinic, and we operate out of the Community Legal Assistance Society, which is a nonprofit organization. 
Um, and so actually can give free legal advice to anyone who has experienced or thinks they've experienced workplace sexual harassment in BC. So, you know, that means even if you have since moved out of the province, but the sexual harassment happened in BC, that means that you could still come to us for help. So, um, you know, if you're not sure whether you would qualify, still reach out to us. Um, I think that our contact information is being put in the chat and the very least it will be on the show notes afterwards, I understand. Um, yeah, and also if you aren't sure whether what you're experiencing is workplace sexual harassment, you can still come to us and we can help. So, um, so yeah, if you, you know, if it turns out that you were working in another province and you called us, we could probably still link you up with a similar service in another, another province. Um, or if for another reason you might not qualify, then, you know, we could, um, again, try to connect you with other services. And there's going to be a list of services um, that, that have come to mind. I'm not sure if they're in the chat um, or not. Maybe not. Maybe they're not going to go in the chat because there's a few of them, but they'll be in the show notes afterwards. So um, you will have some, some options to get, uh, to get some legal help. Thank you so much, Kaylee. And yes, I confirm that you've, Kaylee has provided us with a list and those will all be included on the website with the notes with the recording. So thank you so much for that. And thank you for, for letting us know that there are resources that are available um, that, that are free. Um, so the next question, this one is for you, Catalina. Um, I imagine there's a lot of fear that can come up when you have a potential claim of getting fired if you speak up or if you want to start a suit. So what should you do in that situation? Yes, Paul, and this is very, very frequently the case. Um, so the first thing to know is that if your employer has a policy, the policy very likely has a section forbidden retaliation. And when I've been an investigator of complaints, the first thing I have to tell the parties is that you are prevented from retaliating against anyone because of the fact that they made this complaint. And what retaliation look, looks like, and I usually spell it out for people because people have this impression that retaliating is simply firing. Retaliation can look like passive aggressive um, behavior, stop inviting people to meetings, withholding information that they would have otherwise have, all kind of adverse treatment, okay? So take a look at your policy, see what it says about retaliation and, 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 and know that at least formally that protection is there for you. Second, the human rights code has an, a, a prohibition of retaliation for you bringing a concern of discrimination. And that means that you can file a retaliation complaint with the tribunal if you suffer adverse treatment because of the fact that you raised the concern of discrimination. Um, the tribunal will award damages based on the retaliation, um, as well as any other damages related to injury to dignity and the other remedies of the tribunal, which are um, compensation for lost wages, et cetera. So formally, there is legal recourse with the human rights tribunal. And secondly, um, the Workers' Compensation Act also has a, it's called a discriminatory action complaint that a worker can raise if they experience adverse treatment after they raised a concern of unsafe work, okay? And bullying and harassment is considered to be unsafe work. So formally, there is those, um, those provisions. Would that pre actually prevent you from suffering the adverse treatment? Well, well, no, people mistreat each other all the time, right? And, and I've seen it where managers react badly or coworkers react badly um, after finding out that somebody filed a complaint against them. For sure, right? But formally there are resources, there are recourses that, that you have. Thank you very much, Catalina. Um, this next question is also for you. You mentioned in the list of options that resolving your claim privately was one of them. Um, what is a non-disclosure agreement and what, how is that important? Yeah, so one of the options we mentioned was the, an option of negotiating. And I think we, we ill describe it, describe that then. I think it's way better to describe to say a, a private resolution of your concern, okay? What does that mean? What does that entail? It will typically entail signing a full and final release. That means a release of liability. That means you're no longer going to have 
any um, you're not going to exercise any any cause of claim. You're not going to sue anybody, and you're putting an end to the situation in exchange for an amount of money and whatever else the parties decide to agree on. Okay, that uh, settlement agreement or full and final release will likely have a non-disclosure clause, or it might be a non-disclosure agreement that's that's independent of, of the rest of the documentation. And what that means is that the parties agree to not talk about it, right? It's, it's one of the of the tits for tad or the or the exchanges. You know, we resolve this, but we both commit that we're not going to tell anybody. Now, people have to be very mindful of what is it that, or very aware of what is it that they're signing, right? And and who would they want to talk about this? They, they, there is a possibility of some carve out. So if you wanna be able to, spot, to talk about this with your counsel, your psychologist, your significant other, you, you may wanna have that language in that, in that non-disclosure agreement. So it doesn't amount to a breach of the agreement because a breach of the agreement would have financial consequences, okay? And I think if, if the people who are joining us today are following the news, it is a big story. It is a big piece of, of story news these days because of what's happening with Prince, Prince Andrew. Um, Virginia Goffrey, who is the lady who complained against Jeffrey Einstein, had reached a settlement agreement that included a non disclosure back in 2009. And in exchange for $500,000, she agreed to not sue anyone who was a potential defendant. And so, what Prince Andrew is saying is look, I was a potential defendant in 2009. You agree to not to not sue me. This should be the end of this, right? And and what her lawyers and her are arguing is like you could not have possibly been a potential defendant at that time, et cetera, et cetera. I'm bringing this story only only to emphasize that you have to know what is it exactly that you're signing when you reach a, an agreement that is final and when you sign a non disclosure. Super. Thank you so much, Catalina. Uh, appreciate your your response and and understanding what, what it is that we would be potentially signing off on. Kaylee, this next question is for you. What can you do if one of your coworkers is being sexually harassed? Yeah, so, um, so what you can do, what you should do is really going to depend on the individual circumstances and what is safe and appropriate um, in your situation and um, in the relationships you have at work. So uh, the first thing that comes to mind, Catalina mentioned this earlier, but take a look at your workplace policy because there might be some steps in there to guide you about who to tell um, and what to do in that situation. Um, the other thing you could do is report it to human resources or a supervisor. But um, but yeah, if you, if you want to do that, I would recommend or, or have you consider first talking to the person who's being harassed because they might have already reported it or they might have a reason they haven't yet. They might be afraid for their safety. They might um, have concerns about their job security and they might have other ways in mind that they would like you to support them. So, you know, you could offer to report it for them if that would make it easier for them or um, put them in a position that would they would feel less vulnerable in. You might offer to give a witness statement if they decide to take any legal action or they need a witness statement for other reasons. Um, and, uh, and you could also help find them other supports. So whether it's counseling or legal services, you could refer them to sharp workplaces or, or wherever they, um, they can get some legal advice. Um, and then the other good thing you could do is intervene. So um, again, that will really depend on what feels safe and comfortable and what your relationships are like at work, but you can either step in in the moment the next time you see it happening, or you could pull the harasser aside and have a private conversation with them as well and tell them that what they're doing isn't appropriate. The other thing to consider um, is that if you are working in a workplace where you're witnessing workplace sexual harassment, even if you're not the target of it, it could be that your workplace is, is poisoned um, and has, you know, has become sort of a sexualized work environment or, um, or is otherwise something that you, you actually might have your own workplace sexual harassment claim, even if you're not directly the target. And so I'd recommend maybe talking to a lawyer about that if, um, uh, to see if that's a possibility, if it is a concern to you and something you want to think about. Thank you so much, Kaylee. And Catalina, I believe that there's a resource uh, through Forte Workplace Law that helps with that. Um, do you want to just share what that is? 
Yes, Paula, we offer uh, customized training and very soon we're also going to offer it online. It's, it's bystander training. So it's training for people for how, how to be a, the type of coworker that intervenes, yeah. how to have those difficult conversations. We yeah. do a lot of role play. Um, it's interesting, Paula, over my years of experience, if people knew how to have difficult conversations, I think a, a, at least 60% of these issues would be resolved, okay? And I'm by no means am I saying that every case of sexual harassment is a case of people not being able to have a difficult conversation. Absolutely not. Sexual harassment happens and it happens. But if people were able to have healthy conflict, a lot of the bullying situations and harassment that are not of a sexual nature would be resolved. And some of the sexual nature as well. In any event, we have a, a um, training called Stand Up Teams in which we teach how to be an intervener and a bystander that's that's active and helpful. Super. Thank you so much, Catalina. And that really goes to Kaylee's point about being able to, to intervene on behalf of or in, in that type of situation. Kaylee, this next question is for you. Um, what if I don't have proof that I'm being sexually harassed at work? I, yeah, I think this is a great question. I think there's some misconceptions about what it means to, to prove it. Um, and I think sometimes it can even scare people off from bringing their claims forward if they think that they don't have enough proof. Um, so, I mean, I think one thing to keep in mind that it is in almost all of the legal options that Catalina mentioned, really with the exception of, of criminal matters, which is going to sort of a different story, but really with, with all of them or with most of them, um, you're gonna need to convince the decision maker that there's at least a 50% likelihood that the sexual harassment happens. Um, so so what, what that means is, or, or the ways you could do that, um, you know, it could be that you have direct evidence like a videotape or an email or, you know, um, uh, an audio recording that captures the actual incident of workplace sexual harassment, but that's rarely the case. Um, so other than that, you, your best evidence is your own story. Your, what you say happens is evidence and the decision maker will take that into consideration. And then they will also consider all the other corroborating evidence you might be able to bring forth and they will be able to determine how reliable and credible they think your story is. So you might have, maybe you kept a log of all of the incidences, um, especially if it's, you know, a microaggression, it's something to, it might be hard to remember all of those incidences. If you kept a log, that would be helpful. If you had emails or witnesses that can corroborate other parts of your stories, that could also be helpful. So I think if you're not sure whether you have enough proof, talk to a lawyer because really, um, you know, you actually might have a lot more proof than you think you have. Um, and it's worth exploring whether um, whether it's uh, you know whether whether you they think that you'll be successful in a claim or not, but but yeah, I, I do. I would really emphasize that what what you say happened um, is also evidence. So that's important. Th thank you so much, Kelly. I think you're right. I think there often is a misconception of what proof is, and so I think your clarification really is helpful. Um, Catalina, this next question is for you. Um, can you, um, sorry, can you record the sexual harassment or conversations about it that you have with your employer? Um, yes, you can, as long as you are a participant in that conversation. What is illegal is to record the conversation of two other people without their knowledge or consent. But as long as you are part of that conversation and you yourself are consenting to that recording, you can do it. What becomes interesting is how are you going to use this recording? OK, so you have to keep in mind that if you have this recording and the concern of sexual harassment is being investigated by an investigator, either somebody internally from the organization or an external investigator, and you want to share that recording with the investigator, the investigator will not take it at face value. In other words, they won't say, here's the golden proof, end of the case you were right, the other person was wrong, okay? There's going to be a process that follows, the validation of the reliability of that recording, okay? So the investigator will very likely have to put the recording to the other party or, um, or the other side or whomever was present to ensure that it was an accurate reflection of the conversation, that it was not edited or altered in any way, okay? Um, the same goes if you decide to uh, file criminal charges, 
right? In a in a, when it is a criminal matter, the the as we all know from watching TV, and of course those of us colleagues who might be here who are criminal lawyers, the standard of proving a sexual assault is beyond a reasonable doubt. Is not a balance of probabilities or 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 fifty percent plus one as Kaylee was explaining. And that means that evidence that goes towards the liability of the perpetrator, for lack of a better term, will be um, examined carefully. And there's going to be an examination of the chain of custody, like who had access to the recording? Was it edited? Was it altered? So the short answer is yes, you can. Um, but know that it might not be um, immediately evidence that you're right. I also want to highlight that one of the elements, again, of the definition of sexual harassment is the unwanted piece. And here's the kicker. You may have your recording, right? And, by, and to somebody listening to their recording without looking at you, without watching the body language, without an understanding of context, the recording itself may potentially look like you are acquiescing or playing along to the sexual harassment, okay? And if you all remember some years ago, the Ian Gomashi case, that's where the case ended, ended up turning upside down. Or in other words, the evidence was that there was not enough evidence that the conduct wasn't wanted. Okay. My point being, sometimes a recording alone is not going to uh, play out in, in, the, in, the, in the way that you think. So Kaylee, this next question is for you. Um, can I go to the media about workplace sexual harassment that I'm experiencing? This is a common question. Um, so, I mean, yeah, you, you probably can. And there's a lot of really good reasons that people want to go to the media. A lot of people really want to prevent the, this conduct from happening to other people. And uh, that can be, going to the media can be a way of, of applying public pressure um, for an employer to change their behavior in some way. Um, but there also might be people who are who you know need need to reach a settlement because they need to recover the money that they lost in wages when they were fired because of the sexual harassment or quit because of it. So um, so you know everyone has to think about what it is they want out of the process. Um, and so there are legal sort of, sort of strategic reasons you might not want to go to the media. Um, it can be a bit of a, a bargaining chip if you haven't gone because employers don't want you to go to the media usually and they uh, are very uh, happy to reach a settlement for the promise that you won't um, signing an NDA as Catalina mentioned. Um, but, but yeah, so it's sort of strategically, it might be nice to talk to a lawyer about, um, about how it might work for you um, in your legal case. And then there's some risks associated with it potentially. Um, as Catalina mentioned, if you've signed an NDA, there could be risks. I would suggest talking to a lawyer because you know, it might be that the, the circumstances under which you signed the NDA may, may, means that it's not enforceable, or there might be other, you know, just consequences that you want to weigh with a lawyer, and they might be able to tell you what those risks are if you still want to go to the media. Um, and then you could, uh, someone could try to sue you for defamation, which is when you harm someone's reputation by saying something untrue about them to a third party. And so, there are rules to prevent people from trying to silence you by doing that, but they could try. And even if they fail, um, and even if everything you said was true, it could still be a difficult process to go through. So, um, so yeah, I think that it's really, um, it can be, uh, you know, really to people's advantage to go to the media sometimes, but really important to weigh those pros and cons and those risks with a lawyer if you can. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Kaylee. Um, this next question is for you, Catalina. What if you don't feel safe going back to work, but you can't afford to quit? What I've seen, Paula, is sometimes people who have raised the concern of sexual harassment are able to obtain a paid leave of absence from their employer. That typically applies to large organizations who can afford this, this sort of thing. So what I'm saying is don't be afraid to ask for that if that's what you feel that you need. The second option is to look into the sick leave and the short-term disability um, policy in your organization. It might be the time where you need to look after your mental health, you need to look after yourself and uh, talking to a, a um, healthcare provider about the anxiety and the stress that this is causing you may result in you being able to uh, be eligible for sick pay or short-term disability. 
And as of January 1st, everybody in British Columbia has five sick uh, pay days. Um, you could also ask the employer to uh, provide you with a record of employment and go on employment insurance. You need to be very careful and don't do this without consulting legal advice because you might be seen as having quit and that may affect your options going forward, okay? So that should not be done without full consideration. And you can also apply to WorkSafe BC for compensation, which will you know, include compensation for, for lost income if you can't continue to work due to the, the sexual harassment. Super. Thank you, Catalina. Appreciate all these options that are available to someone in that position. Um, Kaylee, this next question is for you. Uh, what if you've told your employer about the sexual harassment and they haven't done anything about it? Yeah, so, so your employer has uh, an obligation to provide or to take steps to provide a safe and harassment-free work environment for you. So if they know about workplace sexual harassment or, or even, so whether it's you've officially reported it or whether you know there's a rumor floating around and they aren't sure if it's true, in any case, if they suspect there might be, workplace sexual harassment, they have a legal obligation to do something about it. Um, usually involves an investigation and other steps to protect you and anyone else who might be experiencing it. So, you know, what we see in the legal cases is, is it is usually when the employers don't do anything or when what they do is uh, not enough or, or it's they, it was, what they did was maybe inappropriate or the wrong thing to do. That's when we see the damage awards, the damages awards, getting really high or at least higher, which is the damages or the amount of money you would be entitled to if you won um, you know, at a hearing or at a trial. And so what your employer does and how they do it is really important to your legal options um, and what kind of success you could have. But in terms of what your options are, they're gonna be quite similar to the ones that Catalina mentioned. Um, Obviously, with you know, you're, you you've already told your employer; they already know about it um, in this case. So, um, so you're kind of starting a bit later in the game. But an option could be the human rights tribunal. It could be a civil claim potentially for a breach of contract or assault and battery. Uh, you might want to report it to WorkSafe or claim compensation or work, uh, benefits through WorkSafe BC. You might want to negotiate with your employer. Um, so there's various legal options that will depend on each individual circumstance, but um, but yeah, you will certainly have those legal options available um, if your employer is not doing anything. Super. Thank you so much, Kaylee. Um, this next question is for you, Catalina. Uh, does every employer need to have a policy that addresses workplace sexual harassment? And what if they don't have a policy like that? So the Workers' Compensation Act uh, in section 115 um, says that the employer needs to ensure that the workplace is safe and a policy under WorkSafe BC, it's policy D3117, in case you're curious, mandates the creation of a policy um, addressing workplace harassment. So they should have one. What if they don't? What I've seen in my experience is employees themselves call WorkSafe BC and, and because the obligation comes from the Workers' Compensation Act, right? They call WorkSafe PC and WorkSafe PC calls the employer and say, hey, you don't have a policy. No, we don't. Go ahead and create one. And in the meantime, you have to operate as if you had one. Step number one is to investigate, right? That's what your policy should say. It's what you have to do anyways. And they send the employer to investigate the matter. Typically, it's employees that are small operations and they're finding themselves with no one, to, no one within their staff who can investigate and they are um, spending many uh thousands of dollars hiring an external investigator to do this. So it doesn't change to what the employer is supposed to do, right? But they do need to have a policy. It's better to always be prepared and know how to, uh, you will handle these things if you're an employer. Super, thank, thank you very much, Catalina. And Kaylee, you had a, a resource that you had mentioned for any employers that were interested in developing their policies or? Yeah, so um, so Sharp Workplaces is, we're actually a partnership with the Ending Violence Association of BC, and they do public legal education to employers, um, specifically small businesses, nonprofits, and Indigenous organizations. Um, so they're starting those soon, I believe in the next month or so, doing some training sessions to employers. They're going to have a whole series 
Um, so that's the Ending Violence Association of BC or, or EVA BC. Thank you so much. We'll put links to that, of course, with the recording. And um, this last question before we turn to our live questions is for you, Kaylee. How can I deal with workplace sexual harassment if I'm in a union? Uh, good question. So, so yeah, if you're in a union, a great first step is to talk to your union representative. They, um, they owe you something called a duty of fair representation. It's, you know, it's free or, I mean, at least you've paid for it by paying your union dues because that's a part of, that comes with the membership. So, uh, your union representative should help you help guide you through um, through what the next steps are, and it's a really good resource um, to keep in mind. And you know when when you are pursuing a grievance through your union or any other processes, just always keep in mind that some of the other limitation periods and deadlines continue to exist. So, for instance, you would still have to file a human rights complaint in the human rights tribunal within one year. So um, whether or not there's a grievance happening at the same time. So just keep that in mind, really when you're engaging in any of the processes, keep an eye on what those dates could be. Super, thank you so much. Um, this next question, so we're now doing the live questions. Um, does the harassee need to tell the harasser that they are uncomfortable? So no, um, you don't need to have objected actively to the behavior in order to be successful, um, especially in the human rights tribunal. Um, there's a lot of reasons that someone wouldn't feel safe objecting. And there's a lot of reasons that um, in the moment, you might not even know how to object. I think Catalina referenced you know, trauma earlier and what can happen in the moment. And sometimes we freeze, sometimes we um, don't know what to say or, or how to do it in a way that feels safe. So, um, so you don't need to, but there can be, you know, the other side could argue that it was, it was wanted that, you know, they could always make that argument, but don't let that necessarily scare you from bringing your claim forward. Thank you so much, Kaylee. Um, and as a question, um, can you elaborate on poisoned workplace? What is required to establish that in a legal action? Well, a poison work environment is one where people don't feel safe, that they can uh, bring forward issues, right? Sometimes there's policies that, that would um, define where a poison work environment is, but in general, that's what it is. Now, in order to, to bring a legal claim, you would have to peel the layers of what is it that you mean by a poison work environment, right? So is it that you're suffering bullying and harassment from whom and how? Right, so a lone poison work environment is not a cause of action, right? You would have to peel the layers. And I wanna point out that one of my colleagues has um, suggested the, the, the appropriate section for the Workers' Compensation Act um, uh, due to a recent update. So thank you, I, I thank you through the, through the chat. Thank you. Um, so here's another one. I had an issue in work. A fellow coworker asked me if I was pregnant is that classed as sexual harassment? Then when I replied back, my coworker said, I can't believe you just asked that. Why do you think that? Um, and they said, you have a boyfriend, don't, oh dear. You have a boyfriend, don't you? You have sex, don't you? I replied, I can't believe you asked that. I made my manager aware of this and he played down the situation and told me to toughen up. So um, I'm gonna ask you actually, because there's another question about microaggressions. I'm not gonna read it directly, but I think this might maybe be an example of how there seems to be that threshold between something that is a question that is not a microaggression versus something that is. So um, would either of you like to kind of voice in on this? Um, yeah, so, I mean, there's that, uh, to, you know, to start with, obviously we, you know, we're not, we can't give legal advice about anyone's specific situation. So we would have to know a lot more potentially to give you a more specific legal advice. Um, but what you've described is certainly something that in general I would identify as workplace sexual harassment. Um, yeah, you know, some of it, some, you know, just simply asking someone if you're pregnant, depending on the circumstances might be a microaggression, um, but also some of the comments being made sound like they could, uh, could, be workplace sexual harassment, even in that one instance, it's not necessarily. And, and the issue is one of consequence, right? What is the appropriate consequence? So once you raise the issue, this is probably not going to get that person fired unless there's more to it, unless it's not the first time, unless it's a manifestation of a constant pattern or something like that. 
but it's something that needs to be uh, brought to the attention of, of the person who said that and, and be understood that it's not welcome and it's not appropriate in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And the big issue is what, what your employer um, should do in response to that. Um, and they should take steps to address it. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, the next question, are workplaces required to do an investigation if a report is made? What if the person reporting doesn't want to go through an investigation? It's, you know, this is this was a constant challenge, um, Paula, for, for me in, in one of my prior positions because people are sometimes so scared, right? That they, once they raise it, they change their mind. Once they understand what the bumpy road is that lies ahead. In other words, just because you raise it doesn't mean you're right. Because you raise it, the employer has a duty to investigate and investigations take time. They take testimony, they take the collection of evidence. And as much as you ask everybody to keep things confidential, there's people who are going to find out about it by, by virtue of being a witness, okay? So sometimes people do change their minds. Um, at the federal level, the, the legislation that came um, on, on January 1st of 2020 that pres prescribes how sexual harassment needs to be handled in federal workplaces has now a section by which people can be offered conciliation as part of the process and the employer would still be um, deemed to have been compliant with their obligation to investigate. So step one is always an offer of how else would you like to resolve this, right? And at the provincial level, nothing stops you from doing that. The issue for employers is always knowing, okay, if, if we resolve this in any other way, are, are you then going to say that we didn't handle this properly, right? But what I want to say is when people have been heard and listened to and some action has been taken, even if it's not a full investigation, um, sometimes it's a way of resolving things. Super, thank you so much, Catalina. Um, here's another question. Are there any ways around the one year reporting expiration limits in view of the traumatizing nature of harassment? I'm just, yeah, I'm just wondering, um, the, is the one year they're referring to, you know, the, the one year deadline for a human rights tribunal complaint? Very likely. I'm, I'm not sure, but we can assume that. Yeah. Um, so there can be when you apply for or when you um, file a complaint, there is an option to explain why it took you longer than the one year to um, to make the complaint and often trauma, uh, the psychological impacts and other types of things can be um, really convincing to the tribunal and um, and they can still accept those complaints. It's I mean, it's still a rule you still want to for anyone who's within that deadline, you still would try to get it filed within that deadline because there's a risk it won't get accepted. But if you've exceeded it, especially if it's because of the, the psychological emotional impact, um, you could definitely try and they might. Super, thank you so much, Kaylee. Um, here's another question that I think is quite interesting because it raises uh, the question of nonverbal. Uh, I had a case that I was uncomfortable with a male colleague and his eyes were looking at my chest area about half of the time when we were having a work conversation. Does that count? Well, <laughs> oh, hi, Kelly. I think it's one of those um, incidents that if it's an isolated incident, it might, be, it might be something that is unwanted, something that you should speak about, something that if, if you can talk to the person, do so. If you wanna talk to your supervisor for them to address it, do so, right? Does it amount to sexual harassment? Um, you know, it would depend on the circumstances. And I would say, yeah, if it's happening a lot, I mean, sexual staring is, or, or, you know, staring and leering is an example of workplace sexual harassment, or it can be, um, as you said, so, um, so worth exploring maybe with a lawyer, even what they think, but that's definitely, um, definitely could be, especially if it's happening more often than once. This next question, uh, I, I'll read it out. Is it still sexual harassment if the person at work manipulated you into having a relationship with him despite the age difference and you did have a relationship with this person but later learned that you are being bullied and manipulated into the relationship? That sounds like sexual harassment, right? And of course, Kaylee or I would need to have more details about what you're describing. It's potentially sexual harassment, right? The power imbalance is, is, an, is an element you know, the unwanted element may change over time, 
right? And and what I've seen throughout my, my career sometimes relationships that that start as, as mutual consent, like there's mutual consent, and then when things go wrong, um, then harassment develops. So sounds like it's something that is worth it for you to consult the lawyer with. Thank you so much, Catalina. And, and I think reinforcing um, the one of the, the things we said earlier, we are able to provide information, but for everyone who's writing in who has their specific set of circumstances, um, it definitely is, you know, advisable to go and, and, and explain the situation to a lawyer who will ask you the questions about the facts leading up to it. And really helpful to know from your perspective, Catalina and Kaylee, the types of situations that could be considered sexual harassment. I think getting some clarity around what that looks like is certainly helpful for anybody who is wondering, should I take that next step? Should I call a lawyer? Should I you know, see if this is something that, that I can then move forward with? So thank you both. Do you speak to restorative justice as one possible means of resolving workplace harassment situations? The answer is yes. Catalina, Kaylee, thank you both so much for being here today. It has been such a pleasure having you on today and you've been so helpful. Thank you everybody. Um, such a pleasure to have you here today and we look forward to seeing you again in the future. <laughs>